Our final coffee talk of the day is one that I've been looking forward to because I'm very interested in the, uh, the machine and the, the project behind it and hearing a lot of the architectural uh, considerations and thoughts that, that come out of it as well as the interesting problems that it's uh, planned to be solved and, and some real world uses. So we have a, a repeat presenter with uh, Sherard and I'll get you to uh, pick up a microphone and uh, introduce your team. Sure, thanks. Um, I'm glad to be back here with some of you and I'm also seeing some new faces. So um, nice to be back with all of you. Um, what we thought we would do is just introduce myself, which is my name is Sharad Singhal. I'm director for application. I deal with applications and software around the machine. Um, thought I'd give you a quick update on where we are and what, where we are headed next. And with me, I have two colleagues. Uh, Ashkan has been in this forum before. He deals with some of the uh, some of the optics and some fabric level pieces. Hi guys, glad to be here. I'm Ashkan Sayeri, working in labs with Shrad. I work on the silicon photonics primarily, but the optical interconnects that we would be using in our HPC and machine application products. And also have uh, CAD. Uh, introduce yourselves. Uh, she's going to be talking about some of the new stuff we are thinking about as we start thinking about what happens beyond what we have done so far. So, Kat, do you want to take this? Hi, I'm Kat Graves. I'm a uh, research scientist at Labs as well, and I work on a uh, computational accelerator for doing matrix multiplication that's based on uh, Memristor technology and, and new uses for. Uh, those kinds of devices beyond just uh, binary computer memory. So, if you remember correctly, um, when we talked about the machine, and we talk about the machine, we talk about multiple components. We started out with the large memory pools in the center. We talked about uh, task-specific processing around the core. We talked about new uh, applications, and we talk about the fabric. So. Specifically, you Kat will talk about some of the newer technologies we are thinking through where we are saying instead of using GPUs or standard CPUs for tasks like machine learning, can we bring a completely new way of thinking about doing uh, deep learning and machine learning inside these environments goes back to the task specific processing. Ashkan can answer questions about where we are seeing some of the optical technology evolve. But just to give you a sense of where we are, since the last time we were here in Europe, until now, we have gone through the actual prototype. Early this year, we announced the actual prototype. It's 160 terabytes of main uh, fabric attached memory, uh, 40 uh, Thunder X2 ARM cores. So these are uh, basically Xeon class ARM cores. All of these cores can now talk to all of the memory. We have the uh, prototype system up and running. We have run our own applications on that prototype, and we have also run some of the first customer applications we are starting to work with on that prototype. Um, when we were in um, Discover in Las Vegas in June, we had um, introduced our first customer. That was the German Center for Neurological Diseases. They have been working, they are starting a study for 30,000 people over 30 years where they want to basically track these people over 30 years, take their, uh, basically periodically take um, their um, uh, images of their MRI images. They want to follow their medical history. They want to track environmental factors. And they also want to track their genetic makeup uh, over the 30 year period. They're collecting all of this data. And the reason they approached us at that time was to say, as we are thinking ahead and we are thinking about the new architectures you guys are talking about, this might be a good use case to study. For the application they were looking at, they were looking at transcriptome assembly, which is basically the notion that when my uh, genome is read, it, the, the sequencers read these genomes in tiny, teeny fragments, which are a broken up part of the gene. What we have to do is take those genes and then assemble them together to see whether specific genetic markers are actually present inside that genome or not, or those genes are expressed inside that genome or not. That's the problem they're looking at. Uh, they used to run um, software to do this work back in 2010 was some of the earliest software. At that time, that software used to take roughly six days to run one genome sequence in that time. Over the last 
seven years or so they have improved that. So the problem they gave us was a near optimal sequencer which could do that same problem which used to take six days in 2010 in 22 minutes. And they said this is near optimal, this is the best sequence, this is the best genetic uh, transcriptome assembly pipeline uh, program we can find. If you can s improve this further, then we think we are on to something. Uh, we work with them since March and we have been uh, basically improving the performance of that one application since then. In June when we talked and discovered, we had announced that we were roughly at a 9x improvement over what they had seen before. Uh, this time our results we are coming back with is 101x. So in the last four months or so we have taken it from 9x to 101x. Something that used to take them 22 minutes to do can now be done in 13 seconds. right? So what that allows me to do is either use that time to run multiple sequences so they can do a much much wider range of experiments and because my researchers who are doing the medical and the bioinformatics work don't have to wait for 30 minutes or 40 minutes, if they are running experiments and the answers are coming back in 10 second intervals, they can continue to think along those lines and they can make much, much faster progress. This is one of the examples from a customer applications. We are seeing similar applications moving forward from our financial services people. Uh, if you go to the financial services part in the point next environment, these people run large scale simulations and large scale applications uh, which are basically risk management applications. They have, they are holding large portfolios and they want to understand what the application, uh, what their um, portfolio risk is. They do that with uh, closed form solutions which are approximate and when they want more accurate answers, run, they run what are called Monte Carlo analyses on these things, which are basically repetitively solving the problem with, under various conditions and then seeing whether the answer converges to a specific answer. By applying the same technologies we are doing on the same platforms we are looking at, they are coming down to something which again was taking hours and can now be done in within seconds. So there we are seeing speed ups on these problems of somewhere between five and 10,000 X. And it's again because I'm using the extra memory inside these systems to um, look at the problems differently. Give you a sense of where we are headed from here quickly. Um, as we have mentioned in this forum before, um, the machine project is not going to become a product anytime as a single product. We are taking all of these technologies and folding it back into our product portfolio. Last year we talked about how some of the persistent memory technologies were going into our ProLiance things. We have talked in the past about optics going into our Synergy things. This time this discovery we are announcing the Superdome Flex. And we have alignment with the team that for large memory, shared memory kinds of um, problems, we are transforming all of our software that we are writing onto the Superdome Flex. All of the work I've described to you in the past was done on the Superdome X. And, but the Superdome X was a single instance machine. As we are moving forward, we would be able to take the Superdome Flex we would be able to take the Superdome Flex into something where I can take some of the programs we have written and just directly run it on the Superdome Flex. Superdome Flex is able to take de deal with roughly 48 terabytes of main memory in it right now. Uh, 32 high speed uh, sockets, so uh, roughly a thousand, a little less than a thousand cores. So at that scale, I can take a very large set of problems and actually apply the, some of the software modifications we have made within the context of the machine and get to customers real fast. So a large fraction of the machine program now is now turning towards commercialization of the project we have done. And then side by side, my, my colleagues here will now talk through with you about some of the newer things they are seeing within the context of technical advances both within optics and in terms of new processing capabilities so that we are going to bring inside this environment. Uh, I will take questions here, otherwise we will transfer on to other parts of the program. Otherwise, otherwise we can move on to give you the completer, more complete picture of where we are going next.
Hi, guys. Uh, and if you have any questions in the interim while I'm speaking, please feel free to interrupt me. So these wonderful use cases that Shah talked about um, are what you can do with a system once you have that network built and you have those sockets connected. I'm much more down at the physical level where I just worry about moving bits around, right? And so um, what you want to do is be able to have this 32 socket system all to all with appreciative bandwidth uh, between the different sockets so that you can actually get the data that they need to not have that be the, be the, be the bottleneck, right? And so what we've done is, a, is, a, is a over 15 years of work on uh, the Vixel-based interconnects that we've worked on for our multi-mode optical interconnects as well as uh, developing our single mode photonics and the silicon photonics as well, right? And so if you visit our um, machine node, as I'm sure you all have seen, we have our Presto connector that has the uh, four wavelengths per fiber, six fibers transmit, six fibers receive in a single ribbon connector. So that single connector has 1.2 terabits aggregate that's uh, able to go each direction. And in the back of the enclosure or the innovation zone, there are uh, 16 of those, right, uh, connected. So it's not just purely about the almost 20, band, 20 terabits that you can get in and out of an enclosure. It also has to do. It also has to do with the bifurcation, meaning where all that bandwidth is sliced up between how many different entities can you connect with that much bandwidth, and so that requires system balance, right? And so that's kind of where we're headed with that. 100 gigs on a single fiber, moving towards 200 gigs on a single fiber for the next node, if you will, with the, the multi-mode uh, Vixel technology. And we also have some uh, work in the pipeline for the single mode Vixels also to try to see if we can touch the 400 gigs per fiber. But that's the CWDM approach. And uh, where that is, a, there's a slight overlap with our DWDM approach, which is based on micro ring resonators. This is using a slightly different model. So instead of having a directly modulated laser that's you're turning on and off, which can be power complex, you have to have some complicated connectivity to get that all on a fiber. What we're coming up with is basically a uh, an integrated serial connection. So you have a single fiber connecting to a photonic chip where you have a laser off chip. And this laser is called a comb laser, which is a single module that generates 16 or 24 or 32 wavelengths at very dense channel spacing. So CWDM, coarse wavelength, refers to something on the order of 25 nanometers of channel spacing, right? DWDM, dense, it, we're looking at one nanometer or less, particularly half a nanometer for our main uh, target right now. So that just means you are more spectrally efficient in the bandwidth that you have, right? We're operating the O-band, 1310 standard um, uh, wavelength range because primarily the fiber has a zero point dispersion, so you can go a long distance, and the material system for getting an efficient laser uh, at that wavelength uh, range is also uh, available to us. So we're using a quantum dot laser it's more temperature friendly, meaning you can go to 100C and not kill the laser, which is a common problem that you have in data centers. Things get hot and lasers don't like to get hot. And uh, it's based on a resonator. So the modulator, then that's the shutter in front of the, the laser, then that operates as that encodes the data, allows us to achieve for the end-to-end, -end, i.e. latch-to-latch -latch power consumption on the order of 10 to 12 picojoules per bit. Right? And so that... <laughs> That has huge implications, right? Because just like in the States, anytime you move money, you have to pay tax. In a network, anytime you move bits, you have to pay power, right? And so if you touch data, then you have to incur a power cost. And if you can minimize that, you could move exabytes uh, and not consume gigawatts of, of, of power, right? And so it's just a simple math of saying you need an exabyte of data and your power system is 30 megawatts. This is how efficient you have to be, right? It's basic. So. That's kind of the view that we're trying to drive down that picojoule per bit number. Um, and then the rings themselves are carrier injection micro ring resonators uh, that we uh, have lined up to the comb and that do the, the transmit and receive, right? And the cool thing about them is that they're self-filtering. Um, so on the receive side, we don't need any, any other complex uh, demuxing of the wavelengths, right? It's self-demultiplexing because as you inject all 24 of those modulated wavelengths into the receiver chip, the receiver rings filter out their, their, their perspective colors and you deserialize the data and you have the packets received, right? So um, we have all that stuff uh, going on in our, uh, in our demo, but aside again from looking at 
uh, what's referred to as a fat pipe, 400, 500 gigabits on a single fiber. Um, what you're able to do with a DWDM system where you're bringing in multiple wavelengths onto a photonic interposer uh, now, which is what we're thinking about architecturally, that lets you, um, it lets the switch node, for example, say, well, 24 wavelengths can go to this side and 12 wavelengths can go to the other side. So that allows you to dynamically bifurcate the bandwidth so you can work the network correctly in a more balanced way that's, rep that's dependent on your bandwidth, right? So by not having the lasers hard-coded, if you will, into the fiber, you can kind of allocate the bandwidth as you need it in whatever direction you need it. So that flexibility can help uh, a long way with um, making these workloads a lot more efficient. Um, I'll stop there, see if there's questions. I, I can talk forever about this stuff, so. <laughs> Okay, so we'll keep the high level stuff going and I'll hand it over to I'll I'll hand it over to Kat. Yeah. All right. Um and I do or I work on a project that's uh pretty different, um, but is still sort of keeping with the themes of uh the machine in terms of the memory driven architecture where we, we really do have this vision that um you have one architecture that can scale in size. And another part of that vision is then also having computational accelerators, computational units that can also scale. So it's not just the architecture itself of the whole machine, it's breaking down how we do compute for specific elements and making sure that that is also uh, able to translate. Sorry? Oh. Um, so the project that I work on is called the dot product engine. And I don't know if you all took linear algebra or remember your math from college, maybe. Um, but a dot product is essentially the same thing as a matrix multiplication. It's a bunch of multiplies and adds, or max, if anybody here is familiar with that terminology. Um, and the reason why you should care about matrix multiplication is it's in almost any kind of application that you're using, ones that are really popular or people are more familiar with these days is any kind of machine learning, any kind of deep learning, uh, spectral analysis, so signal processing, you kind of name it, matrix multiplication is, is in what you're doing. And in particular for, say, image classification and convolutional neural networks, about 90% of your computations are matrix multiplies. Um, this is really a core bottleneck computation uh, that is really limiting a lot of the performance these days. If you're familiar with Google's TPU, the tensor processing unit, what that's doing is accelerating matrix multiplication in the back in their data centers. And so what uh, we do at labs, or what our idea was, in keeping with this idea of uh, flexible architectures uh, that can scale, so not, not going the route of digital ASICs where we're going to bake in the problem that we're doing, but thinking about how we can uh, compute and accelerate uh, core bottleneck computations, uh, but in flexible systems that uh, don't need to be fixed in time and that you can sort of reprogram or redeploy your neural network. Um, one thing that we're really taking advantage of is the fact that uh, memristor technology that you guys may have heard of, um, which is really sort of a, a resistive RAM, it's a resistive memory, it's a metal oxide sandwiched in between two metal electrodes that by moving around some oxygen atoms, I can change the device's resistance and I take power away and it keeps its resistance level. I don't need to be continually applying power for those devices to maintain its state. And so what we do is uh, with a crossbar architecture, so a, a very simple circuit um, architecture that's very easy to fab, I basically can have a matrix of these devices, a, a square array. I can program in the ex example of uh, deep learning or machine learning application, I can program my weights uh, that you've trained into uh, that memrist or crossbar array. And then um, in the case of image classification, right, I might turn that image into pixels, turn those uh, pixel values into voltages, apply the voltages along uh, the rows of that uh, uh, crossbar matrix, measure the currents along the columns, and that's effectively doing a matrix multiplication, right? The, the conductance matrix that I've programmed into the array is my computational kernel. 
that's the matrix part of the matrix multiplication. And then the, the vector, the voltages that I'm applying are the, the vector that I'm applying, uh, vector that I'm multiplying by the matrix to get the output. And so in a single step, right, I'm doing over in, if you uh, come to the booth, I can show you lots of data on this, but say I have a 64 by 128 uh, size array, I can do over 8,000 multiplications and additions in a single step. Um, and more than just utilizing the fact that memristors are analog and not binary, and so I can um, have a high density of information there, the main advantage of uh, this kind of approach is that I'm not moving around the data that I'm using to do the compute. I'm doing the computation where the data is stored. And so instead of constantly fetching back and forth weights, um, uh, as, as people do in, in GPU structures and this kind of thing, you are doing the computation physically uh, where you're storing the data. And so um, there's different use cases for this. We've done uh, some lab demonstrations uh, for single layer neural networks and also doing uh, spectral analysis, doing fast Fourier transforms essentially. So I have a time-based signal, sine waves, and I can do this uh, kind of simple computation and, and give you the frequency information in the signal. Um, and so that's, that's the dot product engine that is uh, sort of the core um, uh, matrix multiplication accelerator project that we've been working on. We are now working on, uh, if you come by labs, you'll see a bunch of PCBs sort of standing up. We're working on taking those custom electronics and putting it into the chip, which is sort of the next stage that we really have to go through in order to see, you know, where, where we think this can go developmentally. Uh, a bunch of my colleagues have also done uh, quite a bit of work on uh, how you would actually use this in a real system, in a real computer architecture. Uh, so I can also point you guys to some papers on that that we have out, um, sort of showing, you know, they, they did a manual tuning, but for a convolutional neural network, showing that uh, we were getting uh, 15x improvement over digital ASICs, specifically designed for, for convolutional neural networks. Um, and then uh, if you want a little bit uh, further out there stuff, we are now doing a kind of... Um, some uh, really uh, thinking sort of further ahead work using uh, this kind of uh, hardware computational uh, engine in uh, conjunction with uh, another kind of memristor device where we have uh, controllable chaos within a nanoscale um, uh, memristor niobium oxide device in order for accelerating optimization problems. So things that can be uh, encoded in a hot field network you guys might be familiar with. Um, optimization problems, traveling salesman is the classic one, uh, but there's a really broad class of problems there that we're, we're excited to think about uh, accelerating with, with uh, again, this sort of core building block of matrix multiplication in hardware uh, plus uh, controllable chaos at the nanoscale in nanoelectronic devices. And I think I will also stop there and see if there's questions or, <laughs> or backtrack. Or talk more about chaos. I should have brought the. I, I have a double pendulum. I should have brought the double pendulum. We could have watched. Uh, no, I, I have no question. I was just. Uh, yeah. yeah, so. Could, <laughs> I, I did warn Kat that none of us were data scientists. Um, and. I may not have completely <laughs> absorbed Inter that. Internalized how, how little data science we know. That. I don't think it's on. Thank you. I think the the the, the impression you you provide us, and it's, well, for me personally, is um, that there's this far advanced thinking going on. You know, we're back here at the commercial, putting a credit card in or an ATM or whatever and getting some money back. Um, but eventually, no. Uh, I've been talking to places like Citibank who want to understand who you are, not from PIN numbers or anything else, but by behavior. So they want to be able to compute and understand that when I walk up to a machine, I can say, hi, give me my money, and they know who I am without providing them with anything that could be hacked, you know, um, just under behavior. But what I'm really impressed most here is that you're not only thinking about 
what we saw two or three years ago in getting that into traditional systems is that you're thinking way out there past that, and I guess you have to do that, but it is encouraging to see um, that you're wrestling with things that just are way beyond our colour wavelengths and things, you know, yeah. we don't even visualise, but we know we have to address them at some point. We can't just keep stacking things on top of each other and, and hoping that all is reliable and gets faster. Uh, we have to have a different approach. So I think, from my perspective, and Alistair, I don't even have a question here. I'm, I'm working through the fact that I'm still trying to think of what I could even say that would come across as halfway decent, intelligent question, but I can't. <laughs> it's really great stuff to yeah, hear. So the, that's, a, that's actually a very gratifying statement from you because that's part of our jobs in labs. That's part of our jobs in labs is to think ahead. When we started down this path on the machine, for those of you who have been tracking us for the last three years, when we started talking about the machine, there was enormous skepticism both inside the company I work in as well as outside about what are you guys talking about. In the three years we have done it, we have proven to ourselves and to at least some of customers and partners that this stuff actually works. So within the machine program itself, now we are shifting our focus to taking what we have done in the last three years into making it custom, basically available to customers, making it a reality. While my colleagues here are now beginning to think ahead again, right? They've been heads down trying to get the work done right now and this time we are coming back to you and over the last year as we have shifted our focus from doing advanced development in labs to starting to ask the question okay the parts we have done in the last three years are now going out into our businesses what's next for us you're beginning to see the same kind of evolution come again um, and again I mean we have we have hopes for uh, these kinds of things we think these are things which are important for people to understand, people to see that these, this kind of innovation is happening. Um, and a, part of the reason we are talking to all of you again in these early phases is because we think it is important to share all of this information up front. Right? Some things we will do will work, some things we will do will may not work and that's perfectly okay because we are sharing what we are doing, hopefully all of us learn from that process. I'm interested in some more from Ashkan, in particular about how the silicon photonics differs from the, the current interconnect that's used with the uh, Superdome Flex and also potentially with, with something like what Plexi have for um, somewhat similar technologies. Okay, very good. So I can address that. Thank you. Uh, right now the interconnect is a faceplate real estate issue. So you use an active optical cable that's a QSFP form factor that's, you know, quarter inch by half inch or something like that. It's burning multiple watts or sometimes 10 watts of power in this little space. So designing that thermally is also a huge nightmare. And if you look on the back of the flex, there are 16 of those slots. And I believe, believe me when I tell you that each one of those had to be fought for tooth and nail, right? And so... When you are buying AOCs, um, that's, that's what you get. And, you, you, and, and people are selling that because it's just easier to bring optics to the faceplate and then inside of it do optics, right? And so the multi-mode stuff that we're doing and the silicon photonic stuff that we're doing both go to what's referred to as mid-board optics now, right? So essentially that, that faceplate is a passive optical cable and the optical signal propagates further into the chassis, isolated from the user now, and then it's hermetically sealed or whatever, and it is a connection on, on the board. Now, in the multi-mode world, we have what's referred to as a two and a half D packaging. So I don't, I don't come up with these terms, right? I just propagate them. And so what that means is the ASIC that's doing the communication and the photonics sit side by side. And there's often traces in the board that, that contact the lasers and the receivers to the electronics that do the business end, right? And the fiber is coming in up top. So that's nice and that works. And that's what's been working with, you know, sockets and memory, for example, and PCIe and all that wonderful stuff, right? But the line rates that we're looking at, 25 gig or 56 gig PAM4, designing traces that run efficiently at a few millimeters in copper requires considerable skill. 
And so it has to be some sort of an organic interposer and it's, it's, it's very, very tough business to design that stuff, right? But what I'm saying is it doesn't scale very well because if you now want a 100 gigabit line rate to run that laser, even if you had a laser that could go that fast, getting a three millimeter trace to be good SI signal integrity at that line rate is difficult, right? So that's, that's where the journey of multi-mode will kind of, in my opinion, stop and then move into what Silicon Photonics is doing, which is a full 3D integration. So now when you buy a, a processor, it's packaged on a on a, a sub, uh, excuse me, an interposer, and then put on some sort of an organic, right? It's called a coas packaging chip on a wafer on a on a substrate. Again, I don't come up with these wonderful acronyms, but what we're trying to do is essentially keep that interposer with the electrical traces that it has for routing, and then add an optical layer. So what that means is, if your socket wants to talk to the outside world right now, it has to go to a pin on the edge and use one of those, in this case, like let's say 52 of them or 48 of them as the address space and run the PCIe lanes that it talks to to talk to the memory or talk to the NICs or whatever. So floor planning at ASIC becomes a challenge because you have to fight again for the real estate. Like those pins are mine. You're not going to use them for anything else, right? Now, what if instead of taking that data and running it to the edge of the chip, you were able to just funnel it straight down into the optical interposer, the optical domain of your optical interposer where there's those micro rings and you can take let's say you had 32 wavelengths and you say well no I want eight of them here and I need 16 of them there and then another eight and 12 or, or whatever and you kind of spread them out wherever there's logic wherever there's going to be communication needed right so it breaks free that flexibility that you can now floor plan your chip more intelligently and free up pins at the periphery for other things right so that also means then you're not running traces because then the chip is talking through a micro pump, micro bump that's 30 microns in height, right? Single femto pico, femtofarad parasitics. So the power delivery and all that stuff is very high signal quality. So now you're driving the optics that's straight down. And then once it's in the optical domain, you can propagate kilometers essentially without having to worry about it, right? So essentially what it will look like in my wildest dreams is this packaged part that looks exactly like what a socket looks like today, but then there'll be several fiber connections coming off of it. And how you bifurcate that then is up to you. Now, one step further from that is, if we had a big enough interposer, you could imagine then a heterogeneous package solution where you would have a processor, you would have maybe HBM that's optically talking to the processor through the optical interposer now. You would have GPUs co-packaged with a CPU, optically connected. You could have a motherboard with multiple optically enabled interposers with short fibers just connecting them. So freeze up substantial amount of space on the motherboard so that you could begin. So, you know, and this is, this is a story that's been told for a long time. Optics started in 88 with the TAT line from New York to London, right? It was cross ocean and it's working its way to smaller and smaller sc distance scales, right? Now it's in racks and it's going rack to rack and intra rack and slowly it'll push into the board and into the chip. And in 10 years, this, and once we do the silicon photonics and push it into a product like we've done with some of our other technologies, being in labs, uh, we're responsible for what's more next, right? And it's what if then you could do optical computing or optical circuitry networks on chips inside of the socket under the, the, for, the, for the processor blocks to talk to themselves, right? Because now if uh, ALU wants to talk to the memory on an Intel processor, there's electrical traces. But what if that could be optics, low power? You don't need hundreds of gigabytes of data there, but what if you had a five gigabit link between some of those high performance blocks inside of a CPU. Wouldn't that make things cool, right? So it's slowly pushing into these smaller and smaller scales. And um, the other kind of even maybe further out thing that we're thinking about is uh, how to compute with optics or optical logic, or maybe even more generically, you could ask this question of if you had thousands of optical components in coherency with each other, uh, what would you do? What could you do, right? Could you? demonstrate an adder or a flip-flop uh, using optical nonlinearity to do it basically at the speed of light, right? And so it's it's pushing further and further into smaller and smaller um, distances. So I hope I actually answered your question. I, t I rambled a little bit, but I hope I actually answered the, the, the core of the thing you were asking. I think you taught me a lot that was unrelated to the question in my mind. <laughs>
So I guess that's a good thing, I guess. Uh, or maybe I made you forget about your question. It's the art of deception, I guess. Right? Yeah. Oh, no, you're, you're, not, you're not briefing like an executive. You're actually uh, <laughs> trying to answer questions. All right. You, you're very nice. Thank you. So maybe we need to drill a little more into the, the practical real-world applications that, that you're seeing, um, you know, the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the genetics and um, Alzheimer's piece is one, um, but there's, there's a whole, there's a lot that, that's around simply you can use the same tool chain and the same logic that you've always mm -hmm. used and, and work in large memory systems and the applicability for that. So if you look at the current set of applications when we are talking to customers, um, what I find interesting in these conversations with customers is how much I learn from these conversations about the use cases that they are struggling with. And over and over again, what we are finding is if they are working on an application which is working in a cluster environment and they are happy with that application, they don't want to move. The reaction is, I want to leave it where it is, I want to continue with what it is. Or they have high performance computing HPC type workloads which have been tuned and targeted and they're running those applications, they're happy with those applications and their reaction is, I don't want to touch these applications. And then there is this large space in the middle which uh, we have traditionally not called high performance computing. And it's also not something which is amenable to being moved on a cluster. So give you an example of a travel customer. They do travel reservation type of things. They are looking at um, data which is coming in now from all the mobile phones. And what they're finding is that more and more people are doing travel reservations, but they're not actually doing reservations. They're just browsing for prices, yeah. right? So the actual revenue generating traffic has not increased that much, but the actual traffic their applications are seeing has increased tenfold. And they still have the latency requirement of a real-time application. So now they're struggling with it because if they parallelize that entire application and increase the throughput, their latency still goes up. So they are now struggling with something they cannot do. And they're, the, one of the reasons they are approaching us is they're saying, well, uh, but you can do this. If I could hold all this data in memory and I could run this application as an in-memory application, then maybe I can gain back that a uh, fraction of a second I'm losing every time I in see an increase in my traffic. The same thing we are seeing in financial services, for example. Um, if I do these, people that have workflows that essentially do these risk management kinds of things, essentially overnight, so every evening or every night, the risk of management officer gets a report which says, here is your risk portfolio. As we are talking to these people, we are finding that they say, wait, wait a minute, if you can do this kind of a problem in 10 seconds, then rather than my risk manager yelling at the trader, the trader could do this risk analysis directly and actually not make the mistake for which they are penalized afterwards, right? So we are finding this class of applications as we are talking to customers where the current systems are just not meeting their needs, or they are saying, wait a minute, but if I could do it in this time, I would shift my workflow around it and I would be able to do the entire workflow completely differently and that makes my business much, much more efficient, right? So those are the kinds of applications we are beginning to see as we have started talking to customers. And the third question obviously is when can I have it, right? After they satisfy themselves that this has potential, their reaction is, well, when can I have it? The nice thing about the Superdome Flex um, announcement this time is we have been doing all of our work on the Superdome X and we have made no, uh, all of the performance results we have been showing people are on these current generation platforms because they were the largest memory platforms we could find to play with. And in many of these cases, the customers are saying, but if I, I can get this today and you can show me how you're going to take me into this future, then I'm along for the ride here. And I mean, I re go through my standard refresh cycle every three, four, five years, and by that time you will have the successor. What I don't want to do is constantly rewrite my applications and constantly transform my applications. So make sure that y if you can help me get into the software part right now, 
then the hardware will continuously evolve underneath. And again, I'm back in that Moore's law environment where every so often I change the hardware underneath and my applications get faster and faster. So we are actually in conversations with customers right now within that context of what does it mean to actually start thinking along these lines and how soon do they want something right now, how soon they can wait for the next iteration of these kinds of technologies. But those are conversations that they are now beginning to have with our business groups more and more. And those of us who are in labs, are you're getting a snippet of where we our heads are at in terms of thinking ahead at this point in time. And maybe one other thing I could add to that as far as some things that are practically becoming possible by this stuff that we're talking about. With the optics, you break uh, the physical limitation of 10 meters typically that's available now with a copper cable or an AOC. So you're able to go 500 meters, couple of kilometers, right? And so one implication of that is let's say you're a bank and you want to have real time backup at somewhere that's down the street, a mile or two down the street, but that's like a fortress that nobody can get into, but you run your own fiber to a banking location that customers come in at. So you're constantly checkpointing with milliseconds of delay, you know, so time of flight in a fiber is five nanoseconds a meter. So whatever distance you can live with, right? And if we can break the speed of light, I'll invite you to my Nobel Prize party, but... <laughs> Right, so that kind, of, that kind of conversation becomes practically possible because it's power efficient to move those bits and constantly be checkpointing all your, uh, all your data that's, that's live happening versus almost. Or let's say you're a hospital and you have this huge campus, multiple buildings, and somebody over here in the radiology department has a bunch of data, and this other lab over here wants to real-time analyze that data. So now what they have to do is use public ethernet and copy that over and perform on it and then push it back, right? So if, but if you had your own network in campus of your own single mode fiber and you could real time connect the machines here that are crunching the data to the storage that's over there and, and, and then work real time or interconnect uh, multiple. So it takes the whole com composable architecture that we've talked about and it breaks it out of the room. Right, it can be composable across buildings and across a campus, and uh, some of our customers that we that we talk to are pretty keen on that. It's kind of like that moment where your eyebrows go up whenever you, you say, "Oh, well, you can physically disaggregate stuff between buildings," and they're like, "Oh man, we never thought that was possible." Right, and so while being on the physical layer, we we can enable that kind of stuff. Then then the apps and software side of things takes that and really runs with it, right, and kind of milks that for all of its worth. It's beyond our imagination, really. <laughs> Right, I think we might have uh, exhausted the questions, um, but I did have one other thought for Kata around the, what struck me was that, that, that um, matrix multiplier using the memristor was a very physical thing. Um, have you seen anything else that is, it is getting away from the, the whole idea that everything's an x86 computer and, and it's all, all ones and zeros everywhere? Have you seen anything else in there as a trend or is it just that matrix multiplier is the one that struck you as being useful? My turn to make you think. Um, so it's certainly a core uh, bottleneck computation, and I think those were some of the first ones that we wanted to go after, right? Because it's it's a, um, easier to make the case for you know we're going to great lengths using novel devices with new kinds of behavior. Um, uh, doing custom systems for the computation, you know, we better have a good reason or, you know, a good promise for what we're getting. Um, there are some other things, and but they are very early stage. Um, I think um, one thing that we're interested in pursuing more is also the dynamical behavior of these devices. Um, and I, I touched on that a little bit with the, the chaos. Um, we have a, a nanoscale device that essentially I, I apply a certain level of voltage and depending on the voltage amplitude, the current through the device can look you know, pretty steady 
It can look oscillatory uh, or it can look chaotic. And so once I tune that voltage to that chaotic level is, is when we're, we're talking about using that um, in our optimization problems, instead of doing something like simulated annealing like you would do in software, you can do essentially the same thing in hardware. Because you're doing it in hardware, it's much lower power, it's much faster. Um, but those, those are sort of just scratching the surface of some of the dynamical behaviors of these devices that, that we're really starting to explore. There's all sorts of interesting behavior um, um, in, these, in these materials. Um, the reason that the, the chaotic behavior comes out of the device is because it's a bistable system. So it's a, a system that exhibits negative differential resistance. If I uh, turn up the voltage or turn up the current through the device, right, you would normally, if you're ohmic, it's a straight line. If you're nonlinear, that line is sort of curved. And negative differential resistance, you get a bend back. So as you increase the current through the device, the resistance goes from uh, getting less and less to more. Um, and you can actually, at the same voltage point, have two potential states of the system. Um, and that's where the, the, the chaotic uh, behavior comes from. You, you're oscillating jump, between, jump between those, two, those two states. And you're using this primarily as a, an entropy generator for, for the work, or am I misunderstanding? Are you using, using this a, as a what? A, a generator of entropy into the... Uh, uh, yeah, so you're, 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 you're adding it into, if you had a typical sort of optimization problem that you're trying to solve with uh, gradient descent or something where I'm trying to explore the, the, the phase space to find the, the minimal energy solution or minimum uh, error solution, you typically have some kind of algorithm that, you know, you move a little this way and move a little that way. And depending on how your error function, energy function, cost function uh, increases or decreases, you decide to... Uh, update your system and change your parameters and, and, and move in the direction, you know, gradient descent, move in the direction for downward in energy or in error. Um, but you can get stuck in local minimum that way. And so what you do in simulated annealing and these other um, approaches is you say that I want to kick myself out of the local uh, environment of this solution to find a, to explore a new solution space. And so, um, wait, where was I going with that? Sorry. What was the question again? It's about the, the use of that chaotic <laughs> state to, to generate essentially random um, Right, variation. and so what we're using this for is when we do that, that weight update or that, that algorithmic update, instead of just saying we're going to follow uh, gradient descent, um, we use that uh, chaotic system to, as part of the threshold function to say whether or not we're going to move or how far we're make, going make to move, large move and, and explore sort of a new phase space. And so that's, that's that work um, uh, at, a, at its current stage. But again, just to follow up on that particular thought, remember again then when we started with the machine program, we had a, just a handful of very selected applications because we believed that if we could make these applications work, we would prove the benefit out. So when you think about the dot product engine and some of the new concepts that these people are trying out, it's again that same mindset. We want to take a very handful of selected applications where we think there is real benefit and prove first of all to ourselves that all these things actually work and that if we solve these specific uh, mathematical problems, then there is a large applicability within these things and then other applications will follow and other techniques will follow. But given the size of the teams here, um, we, we tend to stay focused on a handful of things at a time. All right, well, I think if we've exhausted the questions from the floor, uh, we'll call this a wrap. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, opening our minds some more. Yes, and uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to talk to all of you. And do come by if you have other questions. All of the research staff is with us, and we are always happy to talk to about our work. We always like to share these things. So that's, uh, I mean, talking to all of you is the fun part of uh, being here. So thank you all.